Hey guys, welcome back. It's your favorite camp of the limp, and I'm here with one that uh, I'm sure some of you knew I was going to address at some point, and that has got to be one of the most interesting reviews I've I've ever read, especially in a while. Like, okay, this stirred up a whole lot of drama, and I heard about it. I was like, what? What is this? What? What? What is this crap? So I went ahead, pulled it up, and decided I'd go ahead and read this review for myself uh, to kind of see what was going on. And now that I've read it, I got to give my my two cents on this because it's like, what the hell are you thinking here, bro? And when you review something, you're reviewing the game. And this is all game anyway. And, and Magnificent Style has been out for a, a hot minute. Now, American Civil War is not my jam. I usually don't cover a whole lot of those games. It just it hasn't been my thing. I like World War II. I like Pacific Theater. Uh, I like World War Three. You know, fictional World War Three stuff. I like sci-fi. I like Agents. Uh, Napoleon, yeah, I guess somewhat like that middle ground, like post Ancients up to World War II. It's kind of hit or miss. It depends on the game. But when you review something. Your review needs to cover the game, right? So when I read a review or watch a review, I want to hear about the gameplay. I want to hear about the mechanics. I want to hear about uh, the components. I want to hear about all that stuff when it comes to game. Is the game good? That's, that's how you review a game. All right. In our wargaming hobby, is the game good? Are the components good? That's it. I mean, you, you, that's where you really need the end. Now, plenty of channels get into the history of it. I do occasionally myself, but not really like the, the good and the bad of the history of it. Just the history of it. Hey, this is why the battle happened. This is how things happen to get to point A, you know, whatever. But this review, and what I want to kind of point out, like just right off the bat, right? He kind of gives an intro here, and this is by Stuart Gorman. So here's his little intro. And this part here, not, man, it's, why is it going there? There we go. This part here is pretty much his review of the game, and even that doesn't uh, cover very much. We'll, we'll read over it here in just a sec. The rest of all this that I just scroll past really has nothing to do with reviewing the game. It's his personal attack and affront on the history. And for some reason, like he's making correlations that don't exist towards the, the game designer himself, who I know I've spoken to him plenty of times, real nice guy. And he has nothing to to do with any of that history, but he tries to correlate things that aren't there as being there as part of his review. If you want to review a game, fine. If you want to review old games, even better, because uh, some of those older reviews are harder to find. But review the game. Talk about the actual game itself. You can give the blurb about the history. Hey, here's the history of Pickett's Charge, which is what this game is based upon. But that's it. That's that's where you need to go with it. Do not try to throw in modern day politics into your view because they have no place there. And it's not the point. And it's only going to cause disruption. And I think that was his real goal here. I don't think his goal was to, to make a review of uh, In Magnificent Style. I think his goal was to stir up controversy and to... Uh, to poke at people let's eyeball the review here real quick and then we'll we'll kind of break it down into pieces so he originally published it on his website and then he went ahead and posted it on bgg as well but you can't really comment on it anymore because all the threads got locked because it turned into a flame war because of course it was so like i said this first little blurb is just hey this is the game by herman lutman uh, it was published by Victory Point Games, blah, blah, blah. His review, 
The core of the game is addictive little push your luck mechanism that is apparently borrowed from a German dice game. You roll 2d6 and consult a table to find the crossover point where the dice roll representing the column meets the row of the other die. This is very quick to resolve and the chart is helpfully printed on the side of the board. As your troops advance, they will leave behind their rally point. At any point after your first roll, you can choose to stop rolling and move that rally point forward. However, should you keep going, you will run the risk of rolling a result that will send your unit back to the start. There are also leaders that can give you a re-roll for the one unit they are attached to and a few other elements to help mitigate bad luck, but across your advancing line, this will only help you so far. It's tense, simple, and it's a lot of fun. Okay, cool. This system will naturally produce irregular advances among your units, but the game's battle line formation will encourage you to try to keep your units adjacent where possible in hopes of triggering a general advance of several units at once. The map also includes a few obstacles that can only be crossed by certain results, which can force you into making several rolls in a row without moving forward, praying for a good advance and avoiding the route result, which will send your unit back to the start. Honestly, yeah, I kind of want to try the game now. Uh, the simple mechanism can generate a surprisingly uh, strong emotional response. String of good luck can feel like that unit is performing above and beyond the call of duty, shaking off enemy fire, passing over obstacles as if they were nothing. In contrast, a unit rolling a route or suffering from repeated heavy artillery barrages at a key moment can make you want to scream at them not to run. They were so close, they just needed to push on. It's impressive how a bit of art can make you identify with these people and was really quite an abstract dice rolling game. Worthington has also given the game a very nice coat of paint. I love the counter art. Each unit has their state's flag, and this is where he's talking about the components a little bit, which is a nice touch and avoids the inclusion of numerous Confederate flags, although the rebel yell counter is unfortunately emblazoned with it and and it's a little strange that the rally and captured position uh, counters use stars and bars and not the stainless banner overall this is an attractive game which i think is especially important for a solitaire game and another game i have my opponent an hour discussion to distract me but playing solo i'm spending an hour of my life staring at my only critique, except for the flags, would be that the rule book was oddly formatted. It's readable and far from the worst rule book. All right, so to pause here for just a second, uh, I, I this this drives me nuts. I hate it when people get finicky over whether it's the Confederate flag or like the the Nazi flag from World War II games. Those things existed just because they're in the game doesn't mean that you support whatever it is. It doesn't make you what you're playing as or what the playing piece is. It's just simply a piece of history. People need to stop uh, putting their own emotions and feelings into a piece of cardboard. It, it's not the end of the world. Uh, to, to see a piece of history. If anything, it needs to be there so it's not forgotten. It, it drives me nuts. If you remove all the parts of history that you don't like, then you are doomed to repeat history because there's no memory of it. It is not the end of the world to see a tiny little Confederate flag. Who gives a shit? It's some stars and stripes organized in a very specific manner on a counter. That's it. It, it. it shouldn't be making anyone sob, right? Have a little bit thicker skin and not let this stuff tear you apart. Understand it's a part of history. That's the, the representation of the Confederacy. And hell, I, I studied the, the Civil War a little bit in college, not tremendously, but a little bit. I don't know who designed the Confederate flag, nor do I care, right? They were trying to find something that was close to the American flag, red, white, and blue, and their colors, but uh, uh, in a different style to make it their own. That's it. 
But to say that the flags are problematic or just it, it, it's just ridiculous. It's the same thing as not being able to put uh, SS units in and World War II games. It's like these things existed. Don't forget that they exist. Taking them out of a game doesn't change history. It doesn't mean that the SS weren't a bunch of evil bastards, right? It, it doesn't change anything. Yeah. Anyway, uh, most of the key roles that you need are printed on the board, and most counters have what the, they do printed on their back, so you rarely need to go to the roles to look things up, which is a good thing. But on the rare times you do, it can be quite frustrating. Overall, this is a fun little design. It's not too complicated, and I didn't find it particularly challenging, but it doesn't overstay its welcome. I could almost find myself uh, pulling this off my shelf every few months to give it a go. Almost. There is, however, one central flaw within Ma Magnificent Style. Honestly, if he had stopped right about here at Welcome, if he had just stopped there and that been his rover view, been fine. All right. Would have been short, concise, hit the high points and called it a day. No problem. That would have been a perfectly serviceable review for the game. Could have left alone. But no, he's got to add all this crap into it where he starts bringing in modern day politics and trying to attack people and associate uh, correlations that just are not there into the game. So <laughs> his little spoof on it, uh, it calls this a glorious failure. Now here's where we're going to get into the, the, the nitty gritty of it. I don't want to get lost in the weeds of how well in Magnificent Style does or does not model the events of Pickett's Charge or how specific mechanisms do or don't evoke a moment in history. I could complain about the Rebel Yell counter or the frequent lost causism in the names of the event cards or how I think the game doesn't accurately, uh, accurately represent the messiness of how the charge advanced. But I think that's obsessing over pieces when the problem is the topic of whole, at a whole. Uh, this right here, this this lost causism, that is him putting his own personal biases into this review and seeing connections that simply don't exist. This is him just going, yeah. I'm going to attack these people because reasons. Now, he gets into this later, but to go ahead and start addressing the point, uh, a lot of what he talks about here is that he doesn't understand why Pickett's charge was chosen as the topic and, and they should have picked something else. It is so easy to understand. It boggles the mind that he can't get it. It's the same reason you see a bunch of games about Normandy. It's the same reason you see a bunch of games about uh, the Eastern Front. It's popular. It's a popular segment of history. Most people, whether or not they know history or not, have heard the term Pickett's Charge. They probably couldn't tell you it was at Gettysburg. They probably can't tell you the specifics. They might not even know that Pickett was a person but they've heard the term, it's popular enough that it will uh, garner sales because people will buy games based on their topic. And plenty of people, when it comes to the American Civil War, love Gettysburg. It's the most famous battle of the American Civil War. As such, Gettysburg and pieces there of it are going to garner a lot of attention and cause people to make more games based on those segments. That's it. There has nothing to do with lost causisms, whatever garbage BS he's put in here, uh, any political undertones has nothing to do with that. It has to do with what will sell. That's it. End of. Uh, see, where were we? Uh, the design notes make plenty clear that this is not trying to be a simulation and it wouldn't be a valuable use of time to treat it as one. I really want to sink my teeth into the big question and to my mind flaw in this game. Why the is it about Pickett's charge? He 
is attributing the flaw of the game to its topic. It's asinine. How do you even get to this point? That's like saying that uh, the flaw of a game is that it's about the the D-Day landings at Normandy. That's like saying that you're, the big flaw of a game is that it's about Operation Barbarossa. Really? That, that has nothing to do. That's not neither good nor bad. That's just what they chose. And obviously it was chosen because it's famous. Let's continue, shall we? If you are some... Okay, is this just where he goes into it? Yeah. Uh, we're not going to read all this because uh, this part right here is simply talking about the specifics of Pickett's charge, uh, why it was a failure, and who was involved. It's the history of it. If you don't know it, go look it up. Uh, despite being Lee's greatest single tactical blunder, Pickett's Charge lived on after the war as the high water mark of the Confederacy. The point of the Confederacy's greatest achievement right before their defeat rendered their cause doomed. Entire books have been written on the myth making of Pickett's Charge. Too much to summarize here, but to put a point to it, if you wanted to distill the lost cause, God, he just loves that term. Down to a single moment, you could do worse than picking, uh, picking Pickett's Charge. But let's say that ten times less. The epitome, at least in my, at least in memory, of the glorious and noble but doomed act of resistance against the Yankee oppressor, a romanticized picture of what was really an ill-conceived and poorly executed attack by slavers in pursuit of their vile cause. Okay, for someone who acts like he knows history to say such an asinine statement is beyond me. Ill-conceived and poorly executed attack by slavers. Are you joking? Barely anyone in the Confederate Army owns slaves. Now, we're not going to get into the, the entire history of this, but it's relevant to this. Let's talk about resistance against the Yankee oppressor. Okay, we can get into whether or not it was stage rights or stuff like that. I'm not disagreeing that a huge portion of the Civil War had to do with slavery. Uh, of course it did. It had to do with uh, Northern Republicans fighting against slavery, against Northern and Southern Democrats who wanted to keep slavery. They wanted to keep new states coming into the Union as slave states, and there was a whole bunch of history that goes into that uh, back and forth and get into things like the one drop rule and three this compromise. I'm sure stuff that uh, plenty of you have heard. What's really dumb about his comment here is he's acting like the, the soldiers, the troops making Pickett's charge were slavers. They weren't, okay? Now, that's not saying they did or did not agree with slavery. They could have, probably many of them did. But calling them slavers is complete misnomer. In it's the, think of it this way, right? The slavers, actual slave owners of that time were the equivalent of what we would think of as the 1% today, right? The the people who can buy time on a, or own yachts or fly on private jets. I mean, that level of wealth, all right? The, it was not cheap to own a person. You had to pay for their entire upkeep and that was extremely expensive. More often than not, it was not, you know, a family having a slave. Now, of course, a few did, exceptions to the rule and all. But more often than not, it was a big plantation owned by a single person or family. And they would have hundreds, if not thousands of slaves. Okay. And that's where most of them were located. 
So these guys who performed the actual attack, who did Pickett's charge, almost to a man, none of them were slavers because they couldn't afford it. They were hand to mouth. Generally, and this is true in most armies, even in today's modern day army, the guys who are actually on the ground performing the attack are not from the wealthy class of society. They would tend to be from the lower class. Now, in older times, they were, you know, more peasants. And then you would have those who were in charge who were from the uh the, the wealthier class, so officers back in the day. But uh, just your rank and file troop, the, the mass bunch of guys on the ground, were nowhere near wealthy enough to own slaves. He writes this review like every guy that was fighting in the Civil War on behalf of the South was this slave owner, brutal, evil piece of crap. That's just not true. Again, not saying that they did or did not agree with the premise of slavery. Most of them probably did, but they didn't own them themselves. They, I'm not going to have the money to buy a McLaren. I'm not going to have the money to buy a yacht, right? That's the level of wealth that you needed. You had to have huge sums of money to be able to afford that level of upkeep. Now, a lot of those guys were absolutely brutal and corrupt as shit. Some of them were officers in the Confederate army, but the, the troops, the rank and file, no, not anywhere close. None of those guys owned slaves. They, they were poor farmers, peasants, shop workers, blacksmiths, stuff like that, okay? He talks about this being, you know, this the noble act. And honestly, I don't think it was noble. I personally, looking back in history, I am glad that the Confederacy lost because I like the United States. I like everything being together. I think the, the states are better off united. I could only imagine how bad things would be if uh, if the states had separated. I never would have wanted something like that. Anyway, he continues on saying in magnificent style, asked me to take control of these slavers and try and succeed where they failed. Again, no, they weren't slavers. Uh, Lee was even against the, the uh, premise of slavery. He was not a, a, a supporter of slavery. He was actually against it. General Lee was against slavery and its practice. He fought for the Confederacy because of where he lived and where his family lived. Can I punch a hole in the Union lines and win one for Dixie? What it doesn't seem to spend any time thinking about is what that means. Based on how many victory points you score at the end of the game, you are allocated one result from overwhelming victory to disastrous defeat, each with a paragraph of text. This text is purely military in focus. It tells you what the armies do in the wake of your failure or success. Do you force the Union to surrender or sue for peace, winning the war for the South, or are you butchered like your historical counterparts? This, all of this, all, all this right in here, pretty much this, all of this, reeks of just personal bias. He's coming at it from a modern day angle and using modern day morality to look at a time in history and, and judge it from that point. But then on top of that, he's injecting things that are not there into the game. The game has nothing to do with slavery in the first place. It is about, it is about a single charge in a battle in a war. The equivalent would be if he took a look at a World War II game and any battle that had Germany in it, or even Japan for that matter, because Japan committed some serious atrocities that, um, what was it, Project 731? Most people don't even know about that crap. Anyway, either faction, okay? And a battle where you're playing as that side in a battle and tried to say that playing these P 
people mean that you're supporting the Holocaust and that your goal is to exterminate all the Jews and to further the, the Fourth Reich and all this. No, it, no, it, it, it's ridiculous, right? Um, I don't want to name games because it's, I'm sure there's going to be controversy over me doing this video. So I'll use a, a, a battle instead. Operation Barbarossa, okay? Germany attacking Soviet Union. Let's say he picked a that operation. It's like him saying that all of those Germans were performing their duties. They were attacking the Soviet Union for the purpose of, of rounding up as many Jews as they can to execute. No, most Germans, the rank and file troops, did not know what the higher ups were doing. They didn't know about that crap. The Wehrmacht was just the army, right? They were worried about army things. They didn't care about the politics, right? The, and I tell you as a troop that was on the ground that actually served in combat, that more often than not, when you're there doing whatever combat it is, you're not thinking about the grand picture. You're thinking, I want to get home. I want to get home with all my pieces and I want my buddies to live through this. That's, that's, that's what's going through your mind. You're not thinking about the grand overtures of your success or defeat. I want to survive. I want to hopefully retain my pieces and that's it, right? That's that's where the soldier's mindset is, is, is that this, this idea that the Confederate troops were fighting because they wanted to further slavery. And I'm talking about the rank and file, not the, not the generals, but the rank and file wanted to preserve, preserve slavery is ludicrous. Most of them probably didn't care. Not to say they weren't racist or not racist. Most of them probably didn't care because they couldn't afford to own one anyway. So it really didn't matter to them if slavery existed or not. All right, let's 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 continue because I'm still, still hot on this. What is notably absent from these descriptions is any reference to what you are actually fighting for. When I won a, a decisive victory in my second game, it told me about how I drove back Meade's army and marched on Washington to bring the war to a favorable end. It didn't at all consider the consequences of what my victory might look like, that I had uh, potentially secured the rights to own slaves in the Confederacy for generations to come. I had ensured the exploitation, torture, rape, and murder of my fellow humans based solely on the color of their skin, a glorious victory. I should be so pleased with myself. This right here reeks of being just a pompous ass. Are you shitting me? Okay. Okay. Let's, let's give him what he wants. Okay. Let's say, let's say that the game had that in it. All that crap he just wrote that, hey, you won and this is what you get. All of this that he says. Who's going to buy that damn game? Who's going to play it? Who's not going to come out and try to attack him over it? He would have been canceled 10 years ago. It would be ludicrous to put that crap in there. No one is going to put that in their game. That's, that's lunacy. And again, that's not what the rank and file were fighting for. They didn't care about the grand picture. No rank and file soldier ever cares about the grand picture. It doesn't matter to them, right? Because they really have no say over it. They have no control over it. Does he really want for every Civil War game? Because honestly, if he had his way and Civil War games now started coming out and have a little blurb in it that, hey, if you win, it means that all this rape and torture and, and brutal stuff is going to happen. 
people would cancel the game and inevitably there would be no more Civil War games made because they would all get canceled and no publisher would want to put it out because they would be attacked for it. I mean, he's wanting to create this self-fulfilling prophecy where he destroys the Civil War games that he purports to like. I'm assuming he likes war games. I'm assuming he likes Civil War war games. He's reviewing one. He's talking about it. He's into those games. But if he got his way, he would destroy the hobby. And I'm sorry, it's just ridiculous at a point anyway to act like a single charge would have come uh, to that potential end. It, there's no telling that winning that charge would have won the war for the South. It might have changed things. They might have lasted longer, but more than likely it still would have lost the war. Winning a game of in magnif uh, magnificent style filled me with revulsion. I hated it. When I mentioned a reaction like this to a game, it is inevitable that someone will come along and suggest this was the designer's intent. No, the designer's intent was to make a game about war because it's a war game because that's it. It was to make a game about Pickett's charge. Yes, it could have been about any charge in history, but it was just to make a board game. That was it. That was the designer's intent. The designer was not intending any historical overtures because the designer, unlike you, doesn't put buckets of personal biases into his crap. History can be dark and I am experiencing it as it was. There can be no such argument in support of in magnificent style. This is very explicitly meant to be a light bit of fun, not a serious meditation. Mediation or meditation? Meditation on the horrors of slavery and war. This isn't an uh, Amabel Holland game as an art project. It's a push your luck a uh, light bit of entertainment. This is a fatal, fatal flaw at the heart of the of this design and I cannot overlook. What fatal flaw? Most people are not insane. Most war gamers are not insane and don't look at war games like that. They look at war games as a game. Uh, I'm sure plenty of you guys have played Hearts of Iron. Right? I'll go digital, try to keep it away from the, the board game topic. And that game, you can play any number of factions. I can't tell you the number of videos I've seen online of people playing Hearts of Iron where they do these wacky things. They turn America fascist and do a world takeover. Or they pick some small country and and South America and try to do a world takeover or some blitz or take out Germany or Germany take over the world, whatever it is, you can do these wild, crazy alternate histories in the game. And none of those games are those people trying to actually purport that they want a fascist America. It's not like that's their end goal. They're not thinking about the grand historical meaning behind it. They're just having a little bit of fun playing a game. That's it. What is this? What, what, how is this a review? How can you say this is a fatal flaw at the heart of the design? It has nothing to do with the, the game itself, its mechanics, its components, its fun. It has nothing to do with that. You're talking about history. So he's saying this is the fatal flaw of a, a historical moment and it bothers him. That's what he's saying has nothing to do with the game. When playing, if I had a very good run of dice, I would feel a moment of elation and want to sing the praises of these stalwart soldiers who would overcome obstacles to help me seize victory from the jaws of defeat. Then I would remember what it was these men were fighting for. Can only be said by someone who's never experienced combat. And I would want to throw their stupid counter in the bin. This is a game for generating empathy for slavers. Are you freaking kidding me? That right there is the dumbest sentence I've probably ever read, ever in my life. Dumbest sentence. 
who are killing their countrymen just so they can keep treating black Americans in monstrous fashion. I cannot overlook this, and I don't think anyone should be asked to. It's a bad look for this game and for the hobby as a whole to be putting Pickett's Charge on this pedestal. It's a lost causism, uh, causism at its most essential. Okay, well then you need to take every Civil War game you have off your shelf, sell it, throw it away, burn it, whatever. Because any victory in any Civil War game for the Confederacy means generating uh, slavery and all that crap that you were just talking about, right? Any victory, anytime the South wins, then it's, it's slavers getting their way. So you cannot play any American Civil War game. Oh, and while we're at it, you can't play any World War II games because the Nazis were, were absolutely brutal. They killed millions. They tortured them. All that good stuff. You can't even play as Japan because they did the exact same thing. China as well. So you can't uh, play any games that have China in it. Well, let's see. Now you can't play any Ancients games as well. Because Romans, Romans had slaves. They had countless slaves. Plenty of those. I don't think there was a civilization during that time that didn't have slaves. And in fact, there's more slaves now walking the planet than there were during the time of the Civil War. Because of that, you can't play any modern games either. So, yeah, you're going to have to just get rid of all your games unless it's uh, completely fantasy. And in that fantasy, it's only got rainbows and unicorns and teddy bears giving each other hugs, you're not going to be able to play that game. Okay? Because right here, you say that it's, it's a huge flaw. Right? Horrible flaw. Destroys the game and it makes you feel like crap. You're all doo doo So because of that, you can't play any war game. I mean, if you really want to stand by your principles and stand by what you wrote here, you can't play damn near any war game that's ever been made because you can correlate something to some evil, some atrocity. So are you going to be a man of your principles and give up on war gaming? Or are you really just writing this as a hit piece to attack someone for something they didn't do for something it wasn't about over something you don't understand. All right, so let's finish the rest of this. Why not literally anything else? The design notes freely admit that there's nothing specific about Gettysburg to this game design. Now, Herman Lutman addresses this down below, and I'm not going to get into all of it, but uh, he says exactly what it was, which is the fact that Pickett's Charge is famous. Gettysburg is famous. I asked my wife. I was like, hey, hon. If I say Gettysburg, what do you know about that? And she could tell me the basics. It's the Civil War and it was a big battle. Okay. She knows nothing about war, war games, and that crap. It's famous. It's a big battle. A lot of people know about it. So if you make games and you want to sell a lot of games, you're going to make more games about things that are more popular. It's it's almost like companies sell things because they want to make money. God, is that what they really want? It is a fairly abstract system that could be adapted to nearly any other major offensive. So then why is it about Pickett's Charge? The ACW is filled with poorly conceived and or executed assaults. The Union attacks on Fredericksburg and Cold Harbor are both major battles. There would be far superior uses of this system, fighting on behalf of the Army of Liberation in an attempt to bring the war to an end and free thousands of slaves would be a far better experience and one that could actively push back against lost cause narratives of war. Uh, the rest of us aren't insane and we can play a war game without ooh, crying about it. Uh, the obvious explanation is that Pickett's Charge is more famous than these those battles. 
And the original designer publisher wanted that Gettysburg brand to sell more copies. No shit. This is a weak excuse for you because you don't have to feed your family. I mean, it's almost like the game designer and publisher want to sell more copies so they can put, you know, bread on the table, roof over their head, same for their, you know, loved ones and kids and all that good stuff. For one thing, as discussed above, Pickett's Charge is famous and no small part because of the lost cause narrative. God, just how many times does he have that? I should do this as a drinking game. How many times he says lost cause of the war. So it is crass capitalist mathematics <laughs> to further promote the lost cause ideal in hopes of selling a few games. I'm not. How does he promote it? Right there. Well, how does he promote it? How does he promote lost cause? How is he promoting slavery? He's not. The only people who would think such a thing are deluded. People who can't take their own personal feelings and the little hurt fee-fees and their why whys and their cry cries out of it and just look at a history game or a history book or a history movie and just appreciate it for what it is. People who just are insane. It's, it, it's beyond the pale to try to say that a good man is making a game about a famous battle to promote the lost cause ideal in slavery. Where did you pull this out of? What orifice did this come from? I'm not here to give out a free pass to someone because they want to make a buck profiting off of a racist historical narrative. I also just fundamentally don't buy it. Nobody is publishing historical war games to make big money, and I can't imagine the sales would be very different if the game were about a different famous American Civil War battle like Cold Harbor. I, how many games have you published? How many games have you sold? I, he's got a list behind him, right? Whole bunch about a wide variety of topics, including zombies. And I don't see you preaching one bit for zombies rights. Those poor zombies get slashed and stabbed, have their heads chopped off. How many head wounds do zombies get? Because you got to take out the head. They get brutalized in those games, burned, smashed, shot to pieces. Not one bit of review out there promoting zombies' rights. It's ludicrous. They deserve better. If anything, the novelty of the latter might encourage more interest as Gettysburg, uh, Gettysburg is a bit overdone. Gettysburg is a bit overdone because it's Gettysburg. It's a friggin' big battle. Normandy's overdone. The East Front is overdone. World War III is overdone. They're all overdone. Friggin' hell. I can see no reason why this game, or for that matter, the game Pickett's Charge or another solitaire game on the same topic, is about this subject besides the long arm of the lost kids. <laughs> cool. Taking another shot. And the failure to critically engage with what that means. They're not engaging with what that means because they're not even thinking about it. No one's thinking about that but you. This is unfortunate because with another topic I would really enjoy in Magnificent Style. No, 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 no. You don't get to play war games anymore. No, no, no. Because some evil, some atrocity is pro uh, promoted, uh, endorsed, whatever by every war game out there. Doesn't matter what side you're playing as, something bad happens to someone. Someone has to be the antagonist. Unless it is a purely fantasy game where no one dies, then something bad happens to someone. Doesn't matter what conflict it is. And I'm not even saying that the, the Americans are always the good guys. Americans have done plenty of bad things throughout history because Americans are people like anyone else. But there is not one conflict. Can't point to Vietnam, Korea, World War II, 
even fictional World War III, because atrocities would be performed there. There is not one war game topic out there that does not have some atrocity that can be traced to it from one of the sides uh, in the game. If you really are all about promoting these uh, these ideals, then you have to give up wargaming. Otherwise, you're just tossing out nonsense and you're a hypocrite. I could see myself keeping it and periodically pulling it off my shelf for a bit of light fun, as it is winning in, magni ah, in magnificent style makes me feel like shit. And playing it leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Well, this review left a bad taste in our mouths. I don't like this game, and I think both we as gamers and the American Civil War as a topic deserve better than Confederate Apologia for its solitaire game designs. Are you insane? Designers and publishers do better. And well, reviewers do better because this is bar none, the worst review. I've ever read to imagine. Look at this starts here up here. Glorious failure all the way down. All of that has nothing to do with the game. Not one freaking bit. That one little bit here in the center. All right. Uh, come on. Let me get it right here. That's the review of in magnificent style. If you want to know if in Mag uh, uh, can't say it over and over and over, in magnificent style is a game for you. Read that. That's a perfectly fine review, for the most part. There's there's a couple pieces, but for the most part, that's okay. The rest of this, besides that one part, is all nonsense. It's all personal biases and attack on a good man for something he didn't do during a time he wasn't alive during stuff he didn't participate in that wasn't even in his game. And if it was in his game, you would attack him for it. If he put that stuff in there that you crap on about, that uh, winning the war means this, 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 and this, all this horrible stuff, if he had put that in the, the blurb, right? that if you win this level of victory, this happens and puts all this bad stuff in there, you would blast him even more. There is no win with people like you. There is none. You just want to attack people for whatever reason. A man you don't know, a good man who just made a war game 11 freaking years ago, and you want to come out with your it's a glorious failure crap when you barely reviewed it. Barely. If you want to talk about the, the ups and the downs and the goods and the bads of history, fine. No problem. Debating history is great. I'm all for it. There's plenty of crap about the Confederacy that I don't like. Glad they lost. But when it comes to reviewing a war game, you review the war game. Are the counters nice? Are the cards of good quality? Are they nice and thick? Are they waterproof? That was something I've stumbled across on a few games where they had waterproof cards. That was a nice, nice little bonus. Things like that, I appreciate in a war game. I don't worry about this crap. It's not to say that you don't worry about history. You don't concern yourself with it. The same people who will agree with this review are the same people who want to tear down statues and rip down whatever and burn this and uh, and erase that anyway. So you're you're striving to eliminate the history you don't like, like it makes it go away. If anything, you, you make it more prominent so it doesn't get forgotten. My ancestors suffered tremendously when uh, the Americas were colonized, right? My uh, Native American ancestry, right? Half and half, you know, mom's dad side, mom's side is European, dad side is Native American. But um, that's that, that half of my ancestry is torn apart, right? All the bad stuff that happens. I don't tell them that they can't make games 
based on that segment of history because it offends me. No, I want to know more about that time. I want to play those games. I want to play as the Native Americans and see if I can uh, win, right? And then I want to have games where I play as the colonizers, see if I can beat my ancestors. I like history. I like playing different games about history. I don't sit there and cry about it and feel horrible because there's parts of history that I don't like. It's it, There's not one piece of history segment that you can cut out that is all good. There's bad throughout all of it. But to attack a game based on the battle that it's based on is simple lunacy. If people like you have your way, you will ultimately eliminate all war games. Because just like I said, if you actually were true to yourself and really believed what you wrote here, you would not play any more war games, historical ones anyway, because all of them have an antagonist and all antagonists are guilty of something. So you either believe it or you don't. And since you keep uh, playing war games, my guess is you don't. You just want to attack innocent people for no reason. Ah, all right. I don't even have to say leave comments because I'm. I know there's going to be comments on this, good, bad, and different, whatever. I'll say this before I, you know, end this. When it comes to our hobby, if you want our hobby to do well, don't attack it. Don't attack those in it. Now, if someone does something that's wrong, yeah, absolutely, call it out. But making a game about a segment of history, a battle of history, is not wrong. Hell, there's a whole series dedicated to it. Great Battles of History. Great Battles of the American Civil War by one of the biggest companies in the industry. Don't attack people for making the hobby unless you want to see the hobby go kaput. I mean, you would think this concept would be basic, but evidently it's not for everyone. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and sign off here. We'll uh, we'll end it and we'll let the flaming start below, see how well this uh, this lands. You guys take care, I'll catch you in the next one.